Welcome to the Sanity Project Podcast, where you can awaken your mind to clarity and success even in today's life challenges. We're here to provide insights and solutions that will help you live a sane, healthy, and prosperous life. Here is your host, Joanne Victoria. Hi there, everybody. This is Joanne Victoria, host of the Sanity Project podcast with another amazing episode. You, the audience, are here to discover a life of clarity, confidence, and success. And today's guest is going to help you on your way. I mean, she is ready and you should be ready listening or taking notes or however it is you do with the podcast. Her name is Caroline Stagg and was a behavioral psychologist that fell into a career in publishing and communications and then hit a wall and had to figure a way out. She went back to her psychology roots, knowing a lot more, and now she helps CEOs and ambitious professionals create a more manageable, enjoyable, and authentic way to live and work and a future that reflects who they really are by leveraging their skills and expertise. Welcome to the show, Caroline Stagg. Thanks very much, Joanne. It's great to be here. And Hi. lovely to have the opportunity to share share my work with your 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 listeners. Well, I'm glad that you're here, and I know the audience is grateful because they soon will be. And just so everybody <laughs> knows, uh, there is a free book uh, that is attached. If you're listening to this on your phone, open up um, her page on my website, askjoannevictoria.com, and scroll down where you see Caroline's picture, and you will see Seven Steps from Confusion to Clarity. And power, excuse me, seven steps from confusion to clarity and power. It's in a PDF format, so download and read at your pleasure. So tell me and our audience, I know I just read your bio and it says what happened, but what really happened behind the scenes? <laughs> <laughs> what really happened was that um, I suppose I. I was always quite quiet and not very confident at school and that kind of thing. And so when it came to choosing what I was going to do at college, I, I really had no idea. And because uh, my before that, I'd studied uh, English literature, German and theatre studies. And I just thought, well, I, I don't really want to do any of those. Hmm. You know, I, I, I was done. So then I had to kind of pick a topic. And so what I chose was psychology. And that is how I got into psychology. But uh, I suppose I was always I was always reading as a child. And so uh, psychology and literature are actually you know quite uh, compatible. So that's how I got into it. And I, I did that for three years. But um at the end of it, I didn't really, so I was looking at career options and what I saw was like social work and that kind of thing. And I just thought, oh, that's not really what I wanted to do. So I end, I just fell into a career in publishing. Um, that was just like the first job that I applied for that I got. And, um, and I just went, I sort of started doing that. And uh, after a little while, I went and worked in Australia for a while on a newspaper in Australia, had an amazing time. And I think when I was there, it was like I was able to reinvent myself because nobody could see me. <laughs> right. You're far from <laughs> home. <laughs> so I was such a long way from home. And actually that I did, that did give me a lot of confidence. And so when I then then I came back to London, uh, I was able to get a, a, another job in, in working in publishing and financial publishing that time um, quite easily because I actually had some confidence to do the interview and he, I came across. Um, that was one of my big learnings, actually, is, is that it's so much how you come across to people and how they feel connected and can work with you rather than the, the actual skills sometimes that you have. Yes, it's that connection that people get with others that it doesn't matter what degrees you have, what schools you've gone to and what lessons you know, but it's how you relate to each other. And I think relationship in that manner is vital to all That's of us. Right. Mm -hmm. It is, yeah. And so I came, so he asked me, you know, so if you were working with a printer, could these people that print the magazine, if you were working with a printer and he was, you know, really not doing his, his work properly, well, how would you behave? And I said, well, you know, I think I'd be really nice to him. And I could see his face. He was just like, what? 
Uh, and I said, because, you know, he's probably having a really hard time. And if I just like, kind of like, you know, cut him some slack and help him get on with what he's going to do, we're all going to come out with a much better outcome. And in that moment, I realized you just got the job. So, yeah, you can uh, never under uh, underestimate how, how how powerful that is. So then I and I, you know, was sort of career building because that's that's what um, I thought I had to do. Um, I'm not saying that I didn't want to do it at the time. Um, I, I, you know, I was very, I did want to make a success of it. I wanted to earn a lot more money. So I moved into medical publishing where I was a ma managing editor. So it was a management role. And, uh, and I enjoyed that, you know, leading teams and um, being creative and, you know, getting the product out there and everything. And I did enjoy it. But then as time went on, I sort of, I lost faith really in the management that I was experiencing and um, I started to feel, you know, sort of less and less motivated, I guess, about the work that I was doing um, because it just seemed like uh, they were a very close-knit management team and uh, there was no way I could get in there. And um, so I, I, you know, was feeling pretty down about what what was going to happen to me you know my career because that had been so important to me and I would I'd um I was pregnant and I you know when when I went on maternity leave I and I just you know as soon as I could get my trousers back on I went to the managing director there and was like you know what am I going to be doing when I come back and he was just very much like well let's just wait and see because like most people don't come back and things so there was a lot of sexism that you know now I understand I could have um made a lot more fuss about but I didn't so I you know so my role was changed and things like that so a lot of stuff happened to, to kind of make me a bit disillusioned and uh and then what happened was both my parents became ill mm -hmm. and I had a period of so I had my children and I also had uh ill parents it's not a great combination <laughs> Um, and so I was then my eye was taken off work really because I, I you know had to my parents lived like a, a good nearly 100 miles away and so uh, I was traveling up and down to try and help them um, and that was just a period of my life where I just had to get through stuff and then at the end of that um, when that sadly both died mm. um, and uh, and then it was like oh what am I going to do now because I I just felt like I didn't, I didn't, you know, was leadership even a place for me anymore? I didn't really, I couldn't see myself connected with that. Um, but it was quite scary because I just felt like, I don't know what I'm going to do. You know, I actually have not, and I've always worked in publishing. So actually, you know, it was a scary time. But then I kind of got reconnected with my psychology roots and got back into that and realised that there was a way that I could help people um, by by having been through that experience. And so, um, and I'd also learned a lot from my dad because my dad was an incredibly driven managing director of an engineering firm and uh he had uh he, yeah he just worked really really hard he would like get up he, he would leave the house before i even woke up and and when he got back he would drive into the driveway and then he would fall asleep in the car and i'd have to go out and get him you know it's like dinner's on the table <laughs> my mum would go and get him out of the car and um so I, and and but when you work under that kind of pressure and you put that kind of pressure on yourself, uh, you know, bits drop off. And so, you know, he sometimes there was quite a tense atmosphere at home. He was very tired. He didn't really have any outside interest. He just, you know, got up, went, did work and then came back. As he said, it was like being on hamster wheel. Um, you know, and if I needed a pair of shoes or something, my brother did, you know, then he just don't worry. I'll just do a few more turns on the hamster wheel. kind of. Oh, thing. my. Yeah. And so uh, so that's that was the sort of experience. I wasn't really sure, you know, 
how I could turn things around, essentially. But what saved my dad was actually that he was actually quite ill. And um, because he was suddenly quite ill, he got treatment and then, you know, went on to, uh, he was diagnosed with leukemia, but went on to have another 30 years. So actually. Oh, wow. That's amazing. It is amazing, isn't it? And so he was actually one of the very lucky ones. And I think we were all really aware of that. And, and I just, yeah, so I think I was, I became really interested in, and how I could, uh, you know, help people with this way, because I just so many professionals are living an unmanageable and unenjoyable life. It seems, yes, it seems as though certainly the people you're talking about now, your prospects, your clients, they're Mm -hmm. uh, automatons, they're robots, they have not left room room there's no room in their life for relationships with the with their inner family with their children with their partners with their spouses and it all's about work and the company yeah and yeah that's been big for too long in my opinion and Mm. i think the opportunity that they have to work with you because i've got let's see you have i've got three adjectives about you compassion No, compassion, Mm -hmm. empathy, and you deal in transformation. Yeah, that's right. I do, yeah. And that's, I think people need that. So those of you who are listening, I remind people even during the show, because I'll do it again Mm -hmm. at the end of the show, re-listen to this, re-listen to what Caroline is saying, and then see where you connect with her in your heart to know that what she is telling you is the truth. So how do you work with your clients in order to get them off this hamster wheel and (laughs) into another place of love, enjoyment, whatever it might be? Right. So, so I, I decided that it, because we are all, you know, you're just one person and you're that same person, whether you're at home, whether you're playing with your children or whether you're, you know, making a speech at some amazing conference or, or, you know, leading your team, you're still the same person. So I, I wanted this, pre, you know, the work that I do to be kind of holistic, really, and to be of use to you in your work and the you that is at home and and is a parent or you know a a carer or or whatever you might be or but because people are so much more than they are at work aren't they they're 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 people in their community that people rely on them in the community perhaps or you know they see them in many different roles so I wanted my work to kind of encompass all of that because um what I felt is that people just you know I wanted to allow people to just be themselves so they're not trying to shoehorn themselves into being somebody at work and squidge yourself into being someone else in your community uh, and like have to pretend to be someone else for your friends you know who who maybe see you in a certain way I just wanted people to be able to be themselves and be successful in everything they do through just being themselves in, in a sense so I say what I want I, what I want for CEOs and ambitious prof- professionals is to create a more manageable and enjoyable way to live and work and to create a future that they can you know that seems possible for them that they can live into that is a reflection of who they really are you know because I just think some so many times we're wearing a mask about who we are and and there's so many stresses that come out of that, who you have to be, who you have to be, you think you have to be for other people, that um, I, I just want people to be able to lead in the way that they lead and, and get, you know, get great results from just being the person that they are um, and get in touch with who that is so that they, they you know, they eventually they just get up and whatever day it is and wherever you're going, you, you just, you know, you're confident in your day because you know that you're enough. They are themselves at all times yeah. as opposed to wearing, as you say, a mask or putting, putting on another hat for another role either yeah. in their business or personal life. But even those lives are segmented to, mm. you know, if they're leaders, they have to deal with the employees and they have to deal with the people above them so that they have different, poses different attitudes with these different types of people and you can't do that without going bonkers 
<laughs> exactly. I mean, really, it's like, yeah. it's just, it's, it's crazy. It's crazy. And that I don't think most people who are in that situation realize number one, that they are in that situation, but also n- nor do they understand how it's affecting them physically m- and mentally. That's right. Yeah, exactly. Because they can say, so, yeah, you know, and I, and I, so I think that um, a lot of leaders think they have to be everything to everyone and they're afraid of letting people down and they think they always have to have the answers and and a lot of that stuff is really toxic as well. You know, having being the person that has to know everything all the time is is toxic. You know, so some of the work that I'm doing is about the individual person, and some of the the work, you know, to, to take it back into the workplace, is about giving them the skills and supporting them to develop their own way of. Get, getting other people to step up so inspiring people is is a is a was a i think it's a trait that seems to be really lacking in leadership i know everybody says what they want is inspiring leaders but like nobody gets one <laughs> and so you know if you could inspire people then how might that make your life easier how, how might that make you feel like you know great that you've helped that person develop and to you know to get into the, their own leadership really because we're all leaders whether we lead at home or for sure. our, you know group we, there's there's an opportunity to be a leader in everything that you do isn't there and so you if you're able to inspire people you can um, help them develop that leadership and and that just helps you because it gives you less to do you know when people are on side so engaging with the people you work with in a way that you know really uh, makes everybody's life easier and more enjoyable there's a Brazilian company that I was reading about I think they're called Semco and the um, owners of that were uh it was a very sort of uh flat structure right and they were really um it's like they treated everybody like family it wasn't a huge company i think there was about 800 employees so they treated everybody like family and they were interested in what you did at the weekend they were interested in your hobbies and you know you would probably you know if you needed to or wanted to go and do something amazing you would they would treat your um holiday time with you know kindly and and and, and try and work it out with you so that you could go and do these things and um and i I was really inspired by that because i just thought that's great isn't it because the employees who just want to work there they love working there you know and it's really important for them to keep that job and to do well for the company and everything was transparent like like they knew how much everybody earned. Can you imagine that? Oh. <laughs> and they they just um, made fun of the the sort of manager. They they just sort of took, you know they knew that that wasn't like unreasonable that these people taking a lot of stress on <clears throat> shouldn't have you know to be well paid for that. But it wasn't a secret. And, and it wasn't an issue, you know. I just think these these things are really interesting. But anyway, to, so, so I just like to open people up to the possibilities that that are there for them in in their work, and also, you know, at home, it, it is possible to be a leader in your family and do it in such a loving way that you turn out these kids who, you know, are just going to be unstoppable in the world and things like that. And, and what a wonderful way to do your parenting so yeah i i think it's for me it's always been about taking what i saw and and working with it to, so you know to to help other leaders just have a better time of it and be more creative and you know now more than ever we need great leaders and i just think that i you know that sort of makes spurs me on to really support them and to you know to work with people and help them find a way that works for them so that we can get the best out of them and they can get the best out of us, if you like. I think that's, you know, I think that's the kind of heart of of my work, really. And um, it feels right. It feels like uh, sort of the work that I was meant to do, which is which is what I love about it. So, 
Well, it sounds like that to me. So I'm just thinking about when did the corporate world co-opt the word leadership? They have sort of t- taken it away and made it something that's that we have to even redefine. Not re- not define it into the types of leadership, which they do all the time. Everybody's redefining what leadership really means. But when we, you and I, speak similarly in many areas, but one that I'm talking about now is leadership because we are the leaders in our own lives. Mm. And yet we can't – when we say that, it, it's like people who don't understand the greater good or the greater – story here you know go how can you be a leader in your own life they don't even understand the concept yeah and so you are a leader in your life you have a great deal of compassion and empathy for your clients they somehow the way the gods decide you you connect first and i think that's something that our listeners need to know that there has to be a connection this is not like going to the grocery store and picking up some bread or some chips mm-hmm. or something like that. There's a connection. Yeah. And right. I've been on the bread thing lately. You know, somebody asked me a question and I said, well, you know, you can't go. It's not like, you know, you can't say it's like, how do you choose one over another to, to be their coach? And it's not like going to the grocery store, choosing between white bread, sourdough bread, different types of packaging. It, there's a connection there must be that connection and it usually happens quickly and I think it happens very quickly and then we have to save that, hold that space for that connection so that the coach and the client make it official, whatever that is, you know, the contract, quote unquote, and all of those things that just seem like it's done in my my opinion, when you make that connection and you sound as if you make a connection with your clients and your prospects before they come, become clients quite easily. Yeah, I, that is really important for me, that, that, like, as you say, that connection. Because if you have that connection and that trust and that openness, then the work that you'll do is just going to be a hundred times better than if there's guardedness or, you know, concerns about you know how they're coming across or anything like that so I I I I do actually speak with people in probably several times before I I take them on as clients because I need to know that they are they totally trust me um they must be a good yeah they have to be a good fit yeah, and that's another be- thing. What you're just saying now is that you speak to your prospects several times before you may not all of them, but prospects yeah. before they do become clients is something. P- listen, people, it's something that we have to do. We're creating a relationship. Caroline creates her relationships. I create mine, and you, as a prospect or somebody who already even has a coach, we're creating a relationship. And you don't necessarily create a relationship in thirty minutes, forty-five minutes, one hour or even two hours you know even though there's the connection Mm. we have to be able to trust each other because the client is going to be spilling the beans (laughs) they are (laughs) that's right and i think there's there's a i love to work with values you know because wherever you are you know your values can change over time um but wherever you are that's where you you need to start and so i i think um Values and beliefs is often a kind of a minefield for people to navigate in respect to themselves, whereas they might, they might understand the concept of values. But when you actually come to look at your own, it's quite hard to do on your own. So you need it's like you need someone there to kind of catch stuff for you. But also it's uh, it's work that, that, you know, because of that nature, you you have to have trust because and it, it has to be a complete lack of judgment in that space when you're doing that work because otherwise you're just going to put up or, or say stuff that's not true just you know that that thing we have about looking good you know that that will get us every time and so if it's really really true for you that you need to say i i know i i hate looking after my grandmother or something like that you know that's the way it is and we can now that that's you know open we can have a discussion about it and we can, you know, can see what's what's you know how you could change things or, or how things could be different but until there's that absolute trust you know i can't 
I can't help you because I, I, there's going to be the stuff that gets held back. And when there's stuff that gets held back, we haven't got there. We're, we're not there yet. So, yeah. Yeah, I, I just wrote down no ego, no judgment. Yeah, that's lovely. I like that. No mm. ego, no judgment. And that's for both sides, for the coach and the client. Well, I think that when I have that relationship with a client that, you know, I can make mistakes or I, you know, I don't have to sound perfect. I'm, I'm, I think it was um, Michael Neal who said something like, you know, I, I, I show up and I respond to what shows up. I've not created some sort of speech that I'm going to give you before mm -hmm. the session. You know, I'm just going to come in and whatever's going on for you is what's going to be the topic. So I can't, you know, I can't prepare. I, it's just, it's always comes from the within. Right. And that's something that people have to understand that coaches who are in the moment, more or less, and mm. deal with what's in front of them. That's what makes a great coach. So, Caroline, how can people, how can our listeners find you, get in touch with you? What would you like to tell them right now? Oh, what would I like to tell them right now? Well, I'd like to tell them that they should feel free to get in touch and, and, and have a call with me. Um, just for the experience, but I'm, I offer like a 45 minute free consultation where you can bring something that you want to work on. And I, I, you know, we'll, we have 45 minutes together to, to, to sort it out to, you know, to find what, what's really there or, you know, that kind of thing. I think that I like to give people an experience of what it's like to work with me, but I like to have a live issue to work on. So, I think that's that's a really useful um, way to start, and you, you can um, use my calendar link, which is I think is on my is on my website. But my my or you can just email me, um, which is Caroline at carolinestag.co.uk, and we can make a date to to you know connect and and have conversation. That's all there is. That's really, truly all there is. Well, as I say to, thank you, Caroline, as I say to the audience more than once on every podcast episode, because people forget the details. Number one, re-listen to this podcast. Number two, re-listen to it again and take notes. Number three, share this podcast with everyone that you know, because there are hidden gems in here. Believe me, I'm taking notes because I do that with every guest, and I'm able to do that and still concentrate on my conversation. I want to thank Caroline Stagg for being here with us today. Caroline Stagg, carolinestagg.co.uk, Carol line at carolinestag.co.uk and you can find out all you need to know on her lovely website and i hope everybody has a great day thank you so much everybody including caroline for being here and yes see you next time people take care i hope you enjoyed this episode of the sanity project podcast please go to askjoannevictoria.com to listen to more podcasts Check out Joanne's coaching programs and get a free copy of her report, Five Steps to Achieve Life Work Harmony. That's AskJoanneVictoria.com. Take care and thanks for being here.